guys, how you doing? JP Saricolia here, and welcome again to another book review. And this time we're going to renew The Uncanny X-Men Volume 1 by Chris Claremont, Dave Cockrum, and John Byrne. Now, as you can see right here, this is the cover of Giant Size X-Men number one. This is the cover for the regular version. Now, on the sides of the book, you can see the logo of Marvel Omnibus. You see the title Uncanny X-Men. You see the name of Claremont, Cockrum, Byrne, and Volume 1. Here on the back, you can see all the covers are part of this volume. Uh, you can see also the scanning bars. The price, oh, the estimated price is $100 in the US, $127 in Canada. And this collects Giant Science X-Men number one and the X-Men 94 to 131 and annual three. Now inside the dust jacket, you can see an intro and the logo of the X-Men. And here you have the creators. We have the Chris Claremont, Dave Cockrum, John Byrne, and Len Wein. Now, the binding of the book is all in black, but we have the symbol of the Uncanny X-Men, and it says Omnibus right there, all in white. Here we have this, which is also on the side, which I kind of like that they're doing that now. And here at the back, everything is black. Now, opening the book, the page is black, and here I want to point out before we get into the pages, uh, it has that arc, which some people like. Also, is uh, the hybrid binding that they do with the, the sound binding at some glue, which is something that Marvel does, and they do well. So that creates uh, the book, or makes the book a bit tight, but it is not a bad thing. I think it preserves the book longer. Now, here you have this classic image of Wolverine. I really love this. This is John Byrne. I, it looks really good. Now here on this page, you can see the people involved in the production of this volume. Here you have a the classic image by Cockrum, really like this one. Here you have the volume one, what it collects, all the people involved and the writers. We have Chris Claremont, as we know, Lynn Wien, who started the whole thing and also co-plotted the first two issues after Giant Size X-Men number one. Bill Mantlo also participated on the pencil. We have Dave Cockrum, Bob Brown, Tony DeSuniga, George Perez, and of course, John Byrne, who is also penciler, but also co-plotted at some point and they we have a lot of inkers Bob McLeod, Sam Granger, Frank Chartmont, Bob Layton, Terry Austin and so on and so on. And the letters we have John Constanza, Tom Orsikowski, we, he did a lot of the stuff here, uh, Karen Mantlo, David Hunt. On the letters you have Bruce Patterson, Dennis Wall. On the colors you have Glennis Ween, uh, the former or the first wife of Lynn Ween, Phil Rachelson, Petra Goldberg, Don Warfield and the editors of course we have Lynn Ween, Marv Wolfman, Archie Goodwin, Jim Shooter and Roger Stern. Here on the table of contents, everything starts in 1975 with Giant Size X-Men number one, and it ends on the X-Men 131 on March 1980. So it's five years of history here. Now, one thing I like about this omnibus is that it includes all the excerpts, all the introductions that they were done on the Marvel Masterworks. So here we have this one by Claremont. Now, when you look at this, to me, this is very classic. When you think about the X-Men and the history of the X-Men, uh, you know that there's been ups and downs. Stan Lee took a lot of ideas uh, from the Doom Patrol at DC and he kind of created that but I don't think it had the same level of interest and he struggled for many years to find its place and there were ideas there were many writers there were a lot of great artists but at the same time it never really yelled with fans the same way as the Avengers did or the Fantastic Four the book was bi-monthly it was pretty much at the point of cancellation. There were a lot of reprints. They were re-reprinting a lot of the older stuff because people were not interested. Even the writers and creators were not interested in getting involved in this project. And there he comes, Len Wein, who is, uh, for those who are unfamiliar with Len Wein, he was the co-creator of the Swamp Thing and also one of the creators of Wolverine. And he is working, he's an, uh, an editor, he's an assistant editor at Marvel. And at this point, you know, he's given the opportunity by Roy Thomas, who was the editor-in-chief, to really take this with Dave Cockrum, who also came from DC. And at DC, who he was known for his stuff with Superboy, the Legion of Superheroes. So they get the chance to work on this. And of course, some of these characters were created by Roy Thomas, some were created by Lynn Wein, and the vast majority of the newcomers of all of them were created, in this case, with Lynn Wein and Dave Cockrum together. And to be honest with you, I will tell you one thing, they don't get as much credit, unfortunately, as they deserve. When people think about the 70s, they're constantly thinking about uh, Chris Claremont on the X-Men. They think about him as the creator. But to be honest with you, those who lay the foundation, in this case, Lynn Wein, as you can see, John Proudstar, I always like Thunderbird. It's a really cool character. Of course, his brother Warpath took the mantle after his passing. 
But these characters and the design is something that I will tell you, uh, Dave Cochran was a fantastic designer for customs. And he did that with Legion of Superheroes at DC. He was good at bringing these characters to give him that personality that was very unique to each character. So when he came and he did the X-Men, he introduced and he redesigned some of these customs. He did a fantastic job on that. And I will tell you one thing about Dave Cockrum is that his art is full of energy. And unfortunately, he hasn't gotten the credit he deserves. When people think about, again, on the 70s, they think about John Byrne, I have made the mistake myself because to me, John Byrne was the better artist. But to be honest with you, if you look at Dave Cockrum, he was a better storyteller with his panels. Yes, he doesn't have the same level of detail as John Byrne, but when you look at the stuff that he did here, for example, this Krakoa, I really like this one. You can see the ability, you can see the, the skill, you can see the reason why he was chosen, not only to be the artist here, but also to be a, an important artist in the 70s as the cover artist. He was fantastic. Most of the covers here come from Kakram, and it's because he is fantastic. He knows how to design these covers in a way that there's a really special. Nightcrawler was his inclusion. He created the character when he was in the Navy. Before this, he actually pitched the idea for Legion of Superheroes. They didn't accept it. He brought that idea in the end, and he, he transformed it into what the, would be the character for the X-Men. But one thing I will tell you about the X-Men that was very different. When, uh, of course, we're looking at the, the stuff from uh, Lane Wein and Chris Claremont's already co-plotting here. And Chris Claremont, if you know, at that moment, he was also young. He was working with Iron Fist. He was doing other stuff there. He didn't want to be a comic book writer. That was not his passion. That was not his goal in life. So the, the idea, he wanted to be an actor. He wanted to be, uh, he was creating novels. He went to college. He took political science and uh, he was just creating plays. He was just doing writing for that situation. Thunderbird passes away at the beginning of the story, on the first story arc, which really changes the way people perceive this book. Because this was no longer a just a content for children. It has a lot, a lot of maturity. Yes, it was for children. Children were the main readers of the story. But at the same time, the way Chris Carmon approached the stories is with more maturity. And of course, all the basis was said by Lan Wein. And it's important that we always keep this in mind because I know that sometimes people don't want to do this, is that they don't really understand that the foundation is as important in a story. And even Chris Carmon has mentioned it many times before. If it wasn't for Lan Wein's and Dave Carcron's foundation, from the get-go, even Roy Thomas involved in some of the aspects of the story, the X-Men would have not flourished the way they flourished because all he had to do is just to come and take charge of the things that were already said there. Now, the difference with this X-Men from the 70s, from the previous era, is that the previous era, the X-Men were a team. They were like a family. They were kids that grew, grew together and they acted together and they were, they had their own personalities, but at the same time, they were very similar in so many ways. Well, they changed that. When they introduced these characters, there were a bunch of misfits. They didn't get along together. That was a surprising thing. They didn't like to be with each other. They didn't like to help each other. They were not a team. They were not team players. And all of a sudden, they all have to come together. When Claremont took over this, he decided to take this as a method actor. Uh, of course, you know, his experience is in acting. He wanted to be an actor. So he embodied the characters. He lived the characters. He decided to give this its own personality, its own story. And that's the reason why some people consider the X-Men like a soap opera, because ultimately that was a soap opera. Even though they come together, they're friends, they like, you know, they help each other, they still have differences between each other. Sometimes they don't agree with each other. And those conflicts come at play all the time in every situation they're in. There are some love triangles. There are situations where they dislike each other. There are situations where some, some of the characters go crazy, like Wolverine. Wolverine was always special. And, but he's still part of the team, whether it was because he is a loyal person or because he understands that's the right thing to do because of he is in love or he likes Jean Grey. There are a lot of reasons why. So these characters were very complex in nature. And of course, you know, when you understand the way Marvel writes stories, then you realize how important, how impactful these stories can be. When we look at the outfits, even I make the mistake, I always say, well, this is the John Byrne style, which, you know, it's something that we say because I love John Byrne's art, but we have to keep this in perspective. This designs for a lot of these customs, like this one, the Phoenix, was a design by Dave Kaepernick. He is the one that designed these customs. And of course, John Byrne took control of those, and of course, he embellished those with his art, but ultimately it was Dave Kaepernick who did the leg work to get the character, you know, in this case, the outfits the way they were, and for us, you know, some of this have, have been left 
untouched for years. You know, we love those classic like Colossus. We love Colossus. Another thing that happened during that era in the 70s, Colossus wasn't as big as he was portraying the 90s and so on. He was more on the medium size, but he was not like a behemoth, like a huge behemoth like he's represented, he was represented in the 90s, which I love the behemoth size, but you know, that keeps things in perspective, how characters were portrayed at a certain point. But here you can see another thing. This is the thing, again, Dave Cochran's covers were so special. That's the reason why he was sought out as a cover artist. I love the colors that were used here. Of course, the omnibus, the re reproduction of these colors is always on point. Of course, this is taken also from the Marvel Masterworks, which I, I love too. Uh, they're great ways to collect. I have those all the collection digitally, and I love them. That's how I read it in my tablets. It's just the Marvel Masterworks. But here you have the same content. And definitely it's a very nice way to do it. Of course, there were other things that were reintroduced through this, uh, the pages here. We have Magneto, his comeback to the story, also the Sentinels. So there's a comeback. I always love this representation by Cockrum here of Magneto. It's one that uh, looks very, very menacing. Eric the Red, another character that was classic villain in, in the return. So, you know, there are a lot of characters that were reutilized. There's some new characters like the Star Jammers that were introduced. Actually, many of those characters were created by Cockrum. I wasn't intended to talk about Cockrum as much here, but I gotta give him credit because when you look at the stories here, far lower, looking really good. When you look at the stories that were presented here, you can see the importance of him in the development and the construction of these characters. I always love the expressions, the faces that Cockrum does. He does these extreme expressions that are very, very unique in his style. The way he does the mouth, the way he does the eyes, that is definitely Cockrum for sure. But here you can see also Bill Mantlo did some of the writing here. He co plotted with Claremont on this one. Uh, Mantlo, he did a lot of stuff during that era in the 70s. Uh, he was able to do really fast scripts. So that's the reason he was, you know, having a lot of jobs and he co-created and created a lot of characters also. That's another thing. The covers are so good that Cockrum did, but also the introduction pages. The first page, the first splash is always important. And Cockrum was good at those. And I can see that all these characters, really cool. Love this one. This is one of my favorite uh, splash pages all these characters and this is one thing that i will tell you that when people think about who is the best artist to introduce many characters in one single page of course uh, in this case george Perez will be number one but the second one in my opinion would be dave cockrum he did that with the legion of superheroes and definitely you can see it here he's able to introduce and put a lot of characters in in one single page so he is good at that and of course all these characters some of them he created we have gladiator i always love this character really good there's a lot of battles, there's a lot of action, there's a lot of movement, and Cockrum was really good at it. That was his element. He was able to reproduce his action scenes. He did that with his covers, definitely did it with the art. Now, this is an important page. It's 108. This is the introduction of John Byrne. Uh, here, of course, the covers mostly were done by Cockrum, but here you can see John Byrne. Now, John Byrne, this is the first issue that he does. He's coming. He already had experience with Claremont. He was working with Aaron Fitz and doing other things with him. So he came to do this. And to be honest with you, you can see that there's a difference. At the beginning, of course, he's a bit shaky. As, as we progress in the book, you're going to see his art developing and getting more mature and better. But here you can see that there's a difference in the way he does things. Austin came with him. And to be honest, Austin will always be the best anchor, in my opinion, for Burn. Love this. Cockrum covered really good, too. This is a favorite of mine, always been. And here you can see also again John Byrne. With the help of Terry Austin, definitely you can see the beauty in his art. You can see how good he is. Now, this is another cover by Cockrum. Now, this is Tony Desuniga. For those who aren't familiar with Tony Desuniga, he is a pioneer, a Filipino pioneer, because he was the first Filipino artist that was allowed to work in American comics, or the first one that uh, worked in American comics in the back in the 70s. Here you can see his art, very dynamic. He also did some inking in, in some other pages. Sometimes we miss some of the things that, you know, we are concentrating on one artist or with the writer or this, that we don't see some of the other people that were involved in the whole process. Now, this is another Cacrum page, and I love this cover. This is really good. And here, John Byrne coming back. Always look, I love this intro. Another villain that was reintroduced, Mesmero. You know, and sometimes you can say that some of the facial expressions primarily in the beginning of his career were very similar. Some people say that he has continued doing the same thing. 
I don't think so, but I would say that some things are like some characters that look like the other characters, particularly with women. Now, I love this page with Magneto here. Really cool. Love the design. You know, this is a design that has been always with Magneto. It doesn't need to change. I think it's perfect as it is. And here you can see now this is one that we need to look at. This is George Perez cover. Just to think about it, um, George Perez didn't get a chance to really work on X-Men as, as much as we would like for him to have worked on. Of course, he drew the characters in other events, but never really on the X-Men, only in one page, and we're gonna get to that in an annual in a moment. Some people would say that the volume two, Omnibus two is the better book. I will kind of disagree in some way, because I think this laid the foundation for what the characters would be. So if I will tell you, if you have to go for the Omnibuses, go for this one and get the second one too. Those two are the most important in my opinion. They go back to back. This is covered by John Byrne. He didn't do as many covers there. I don't think he was as spectacular as the Cochran, but he did some really iconic covers as well. Now, another thing that I will say John Barry was doing that I loved is in his splash covers, he would write these letters as the classic era of the 50s and 40s, you know, something that you would see with Jack Kirby, something that you would see with Cooper, something that you see with some of those Neil Adams, some of those classic artists. So he had a lot of inspiration from them and he did that as well. And um, to be honest with you, this is one of my favorite issues because here you have the Savage Land. I consider one of the best stories that were drawn. Anything that has to do with the Savage Land was really done well by John Byrne. Always loved those issues. Loved the way he portrayed the characters, the musculature, the physique. You know, he make, you know, to be honest with you, when you get started looking at uh, Wolverine when he started, he's just a tiny little fella. But, you know, he gave him all this, the hair and all that stuff. That was something that John Byrne did. But he looks more like a, a menace. You know, he definitely looked like a menace. And definitely, again, Storm done nicely. And also, you can see Jean Grey done nicely. Here, you feel that this is more like a story happening, like a movie happening. That's something that John Byrne did. And this is one, I love this one. I always loved Sauron. He looks so menacing, of course, right there. Uh, Storm looking so hot there too. She's always looking hot no matter what. So yeah, I love that. I really love that. And here you have, this is a cover uh, by John Byrne. Love this one. You know, he almost misses, but he almost cut him two in half. Kassar right there in the back. This is the thing, I really love this. This is another, there were different story arcs here. I love Kassar there, but you know, to be honest, all these story arcs are so unique and different and they're full of life. This is the reason why I recommend this book. When people say you should go for the second one, I say, I'm sorry, but you should just go for this one first, then grab the other one. Because this is setting the foundation. And again, here you can see the classic splash pages. Love those classic splash pages. And look at this one right here. You know, this is the thing. When you're, people say that John Byrne doesn't do as much background, I'm telling you, you're wrong because he does and he does it well too you know of course you know it takes an effort but he knows how to do it some people say that he was lazy because he was breaking some of the classic layouts uh, the classic panel layout with the nine uh, the three panels at the top three at the center and three at the bottom he's just going for less but to be honest with you they were really dynamic they are so dynamic that you don't notice the difference and you know, to me, they were great. And there were so many different scenes. Another thing that he was doing is that he gave him a more, uh, I would say more modern look, even when they were dressing up, they were dressing up according to the times. Of course, this is the late seventies, getting into the uh, early eighties. So he's given them the more contemporary look of the time. Now, the person that did the inking here is Rick Villamonte. He's the inker there. And I will say that Villamonte did a good job. It's a good job, but I still think that Austin does a much better job. And this is a reminder that in the end, many people have said over the years that to be honest, when you consider John, you also have to consider Terry as part of the package, you know, because a lot of the stuff that really was John, technically what you're looking at is that Terry Austin's inks on top of it, embellishing his art, which is true. Now, to give more insight into Terry Austin's background, he started with the Krusty Bunkers, the company, well, that was the name to the company of Neil Adams. And this were inkers, they were the people that were finishers, that were doing a lot of work for a lot of different companies. Uh, but I really did a lot of stuff with Marvel, also with DC. This is where many artists really kind of hone their skills and Terry Austin was one of them. And definitely you can see, when he comes to buy ink, he inks, he is one of the best in the industry for sure. Here we can see Guardian again, and we are going to get to see Alpha Flight at some point that also was introduced here, and then John Byrne took, took that and created the book, uh, which I review 
uh, some years ago. Here you can see them right there. Love these characters, great stories. I know some people are having a hard time trying to find the book. Um, you can still find it, but I think in Canada, they love the characters, so I think it's sold out over there. This is a great cover by Cochrane again. It's a classic, iconic cover. The art, of course, of John Byrne. Now, I want to point this out because this is one example of what a lot of people are saying that Byrne's faces, particularly with women, are all the same. And here, this is Colleen Wick. And if you compare this to Maura McTaggart, the face looks the same. If you compare them to different panels, they look the same. Even the, the, the hair is the same, you know, it's just the same. So that's one thing that we can point out as criticism of his art. I will tell you that I think that was more prevalent in the early years, something that he was improved over time later. You can see on the Fantastic Four and so on and so on. He was getting better and better. But it doesn't mean that there was not always that criticism at some point of his art. But here you can see, love this story here with Arcade. And this is another cover by Cockrum. This is Frank Miller's cover, which Frank Miller also didn't do much stuff for the X-Men. But here you can see the difference with uh, George Perez. George Perez does this. Eric Conn, the Magnificent. Eric Conn came, of course, from the stories from the Avengers. This was the first annual that was done by Chris Claremont. In my opinion, George Perez would have been a fantastic artist for the X-Men if given the chance. If, you know, he did a lot of stuff with the Avengers, but if he was ever given the chance to do the X-Men, in my opinion, he would have been fantastic. Uh, because here you can see how he brings the characters, the level of detail, that's something. You know, when you talk about the best artists in that era, in my opinion, you're thinking about John Byrne and you're thinking about George Perez. I think both were very equal in so many ways. Uh, there are some pluses from one or the other. My favorite has always been John Byrne, but George Perez has a level in some ways above uh, John Byrne in a lot of things. Of course, the way he did this, as you can see right here, this background, all this detail, that's something that is so amazing. And I don't think there's other artists. There are artists out there that can do it and replicate that. But George Perez was unique in doing such thing. And not only he did it just in one splash, he did it throughout the different pages and panels. You can see that and how beautiful Storm looks right there. She looks hot right there. She's super hot there. So I'm telling you, the stories here are really good. They are so influential. Here's Jason Wingard. He's a piece of work. Never really liked the character. And this is the, the Proteus uh, storyline and the, the son uh, Maura McTaggart. A lot of these things were actually brought into the TV show in the 90s. Pretty much re-envisioned for the TV show. But a lot of the stories are so iconic and so important in the development of the Uncanny X-Men. And that goes back to the way Chris Claremont, of course, it goes back to the introduction by Lynn Wein, but Chris Claremont took this and expanded and created so much richness in every character that up to this day, we're really benefiting from all of that. As you can see, I love uh, McTaggart. She looks really hot there too so there are a lot of things here you can see madrox so many characters and here's the foundation that is set of course for the the phoenix saga and here you can see emma frost that was introduced also the introduction on kitty pride shadow cat now this is dazzler this is uh, by jrgr the cover now this character was created by the falco and also by jrgr that was the design it was the plan was to introduce this character for other aspects uh, i think there was a uh, they desired to create a character in comics but also uh, a music artist to find somebody to do some stuff on tv and movies ultimately that didn't work out so they have this character still left over so they brought it to the x-men this is the introduction into the phoenix saga the black queen another great design Design. All of these things are so iconic. Now here you can see Prisoners of the White Queen. This is a really nice cover by Byrne. It's a iconic cover for sure. And I love this introduction, the way he did this uh, splash page, the introduction page with the faces of the characters and Kitty Pride running. At this point, uh, John Byrne is so comfortable in his art. He's not doing that many panels, but whatever panel he's doing, they're full of energy. Look at Logan right there. He looks terrific right there. Scary dude for sure. And the, the, the team is just working in a way that is just perfection. This is the best time of the X-Men. And of course, some people say that this is left on a cliffhanger, uh, but this is the reason why you buy volume two for sure. Now here you have all the extras. You have extra covers, uh, the design for the outsiders. This is the design that Cartoon did for Nightcrawler is here and also the design that was done for storm this is the name of the character at the beginning was supposed to be black cat they changed it to storm i prefer storm now so there were other things and the designs of course cochran was doing with the designs of the customs which was amazing there's not that many extras but whatever is introduced here 
in my opinion is super super good the covers from classic x-men love those covers as well i need to review that book at some point but uh, i'm telling you this is a phenomenal phenomenal book this is actually the john watson's cover it's at the back and this is it all right guys what can i say this is a fantastic book you're a big x-men fan you need to have this one and then of course get volume two as a companion to this now what is your opinion what do you think about this book what do you think about the impact of the x-men in pop culture and comics let me know in the comments below so once again my friends thanks for watching don't forget to like to comment and to subscribe to the channel hit the notification button to reminded of the next video follow me on social media facebook twitter instagram the links are down below and please consider supporting the channel financially through Patreon. My friends, God bless you. Take care. I will talk to you again. Bye-bye.